Do you know anybody who has absolutely no integrity? Maybe the name of a person comes to mind now. And I want you to consider what does it mean if you say somebody doesn't have any integrity at all? What does it mean? What are the definitions that gives you this notion that you feel that person doesn't have any integrity? Let's also think about the implications, the repercussions of somebody that does not live with integrity. And very often it's very easy for us to point other people out who don't live with integrity, but we're not always doing the same when we evaluate our own behavior. Somebody said the other day, we evaluate other people's behavior, but we evaluate our own intentions. And I mean, you can have good intentions, but that's not how people experience you. The definition of integrity has massive consequences in life. Proverbs, Proverbs 11 verse 11 is one of those powerful statements in the Bible that says, By the blessing and the influence of upright people, a city will be exalted, but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. We see and experience it right across this planet that if there is integrity in leadership, the people flourish and the city flourishes, the nation flourishes. But we see it when there's no integrity in leadership, whether that is leadership in a household where you as a parent lead your children, or leadership in a business, or leadership in social society, or leadership in governance. When there's wickedness in leadership, it overthrows, it destroys. The closest term that I could find in the Bible for our modern term integrity, the word integrity, is the Greek word aletheis, and it talks about truthfulness. And I want to read you a story in Matthew chapter 22 where people are talking about Jesus, and they are saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and that you teach the way of God truthfully. What a statement. So they say, we know that you walk the talk. It's not just that you teach it, you actually show it. And we see sincerity. It means that what we see is what we get. This is a fantastic definition. Matthew chapter 22, verse 16, that helps me to understand when I use the word integrity, it includes an individual where there is sincerity and authenticity. And secondly, it is somebody that is truthful. It is where intention and action comes together, and what you see is what you get. And obviously, integrity builds and breeds trust. And you and I know that trust is the true currency of humanity. It's the currency of business. It's the currency of governance. It's the currency of church leadership is trust. That's why this is such an important topic. And Dr. Deo has much to say about integrity. We believe that integrity is actually defined by Jesus. It means that if you study Christ, you see integrity. And it's not just a study of his integrity. He also releases the discovery of my integrity as I study him and I discover Christ in me. What I see in the life of Jesus is that he lived from an inner code, an inner conviction that was not swayed by public opinion. Other people's opinions were not strong enough to take him away from this inner conviction that God has called me and I'm reporting to him. I'm reporting to my father, reporting to my calling and other people's opinions has to be submitted. That was the inner code. And you could see that he lived, he expressed his life towards other people from that inner code. He did not live for the acceptance of the crowds. His deepest desire was to honor his father. That is the foundation of an integrous life. If you get to that point where you've made up your mind, what is the highest desire of my life? What is the biggest achievement? It is, is it to please people? Is it to be popular? Is it to be a success? In this instance, and in my instance, I've said no. I want to honor God. 
I want to live with integrity. We've said much about identity a couple of weeks ago, and I just want to get back to that in a minute, because I believe that integrity flows out of somebody whose identity has been settled, because integrity is living from the inside out. It's living from the inside out. The question is, is your inside settled and in place? Is your inside at a place where you say and integrity starts when I see myself as the person that God says I am, and then my behavior adjusts to that image or that picture that I have of myself? I love the word integrity. It also refers to the concept of living an integrated life. What, you, what I am on the inside is what I am on the outside. It's one of the most important decisions that I've ever made in my life. That on the pulpit or on a stage, I want to be the same person that I am in the corridors of, of, of our offices. I want to be the same person on the sports field as I am in church. It's one of the things that always is so funny for me, you know, um, to me, because people can be quite excited in a sports event, but when it comes to our, our worship and so on, we're very reserved. So that's one of the places where I think that you see that we have double standards. We have, we have this, this conviction for some reason that I cannot be myself everywhere. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, we said two weeks ago that he made Christ who wasn't sinful at all. He made him sin on my behalf, so that I can become the righteousness of God. Do you realize that he paid the ultimate price, not just for your freedom, but to empower you to live in your new identity, to empower you to live a life that is free from sin and free from all of these dimensions that are pulling me down? That is what gives us the ability. What gives us the ability to live the life of Christ is the revelation of His righteousness. And I want to take you now to Hebrews chapter 10. This is such an important scripture. It says, by the offering of one person, God has perfected forever and completely cleansed those who are being sacrificed. Uh, sanctified, it brings each believer to spiritual completion and maturity. So there's an interesting anomaly here because it basically says that he has completed us, he has made us perfect, but still he is bringing us to maturity or to sanctification. He has redeemed us, he has restored us, but sometimes we see how that identity and reality now has to filter through to everything that I believe and who I am. We see a fantastic example in the Bible where a guy with the name of Peter got saved. Peter is the same person full of the Holy Spirit who preached that sermon in Acts chapter 2 and thousands of people got saved. This same Peter in chapter 10 of Acts had this interaction in a dream where God showed him unclean animals. And he said, I'm not going to eat of them. And then God said, well, don't you call unclean what I have cleansed. So what basically happened in that chapter is that a person who was already saved, a person who was already full of the Spirit, a person who was already a leader in the church fraternity, had racism still in his heart and segregation. And he believed that God works specially with certain special people and he works differently with other people. And God actually displays how Peter, let's read that uh, Hebrews 10 again, by one offering you've been perfected. You have been completely cleansed, but you are being sanctified, meaning that the truth of your redemption is now flooding into every part of what you believe, into every conviction. God makes us holy. It is not our behavior, our actions that makes us holy. He has made us holy in Christ. But now because we have discovered that holiness, there are certain things that are unacceptable to us. It would have been okay 10 years ago to speak in a certain way, to live in a certain way, to conduct myself in terms of finances in a certain way, in terms of relationships. But in my new discovery that he is my father, this is who I am, suddenly I say there are things that I don't want to do, that I don't have to do anymore. Holiness is actually a term in the Bible that talks about separation. It be 
it means that I've been set apart. I'm not just common. I am special. I've been set apart for a specific purpose. And my first purpose is to live a life of dedication to this creator who has given everything to me. And in response to that, I now say, Lord, I want to live for you. Integrity is that inner code that I'm living for God. I'm not living for myself even anymore. Now, if I say that in one line, in one sentence, it has massive implications. It's the biggest battle of humanity, is that since I was born, I wanted things for myself, and I wanted to be independent, and I wanted to be successful. But as I grew in life, I started discovering that there are higher purposes, the purposes of living beyond myself, of living for somebody else. So it's fantastic that I'm forgiven, like I said uh, uh, two weeks ago. Righteousness is to be forgiven. It's fantastic that I have relationship with God. But I want to continue to live the fullness of the life that He has for me. And I want to live a life of victory. That is what righteousness means. If I have received righteousness, if I have received the completeness of Christ, then there are certainly very important implications. The way that I treat my wife my wife is not my choice anymore. It's not my decision on how I'm going to treat her. That decision, that choice is directly influenced by God's perspective of marriage, of myself, and of the, of, of the love that he has for that individual. And I treat other people from that perspective now. It's living from the inside out. It's integrity. It's my behavior aligning with an inner code that is defined by God himself and by nothing else. I know you ask the same question that I've often asked, Lord, so if I have been completed, let's just look at Hebrews again. If by one offering I've been perfected, if I've been completely cleansed by one offering, why do I then still sometimes struggle with old habits? Why do I have these things in my life that I try to get rid of that I cannot get rid of? And it's as though sin sometimes plagues me sinfulness. Now, I've already said in the last two weeks, I'm not a sinner anymore. But why then, John, do I still struggle with thoughts that come to my mind, with habits and things that I know doesn't please God? Why do I struggle with irritation? And why do I struggle with all of these character traits that doesn't reflect the fact that I am perfect according to the Bible, that I've been completed in Christ? Why do I have these battles then? I actually believe in what is coined in this particular phrase as the law of replacement. And I'd like to show it to you in the scriptures. This is how I approach, this is how I challenge you to approach the battles that you have with elements in your life where you feel this is not aligned with the inner code, with the inner conviction of the values that I found in my relationship with Jesus. So I see in Romans chapter 12, verse 21, where it talks about the law of replacement. It's a very simple one line that says, Do not be overcome and conquered by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is a very simple statement, but it is a fantastic revelation that you and I need to get. And I want to use the metaphor of a filing cabinet. So if you walk up to a filing cabinet and you draw out one of the drawers, then you'll see all of these files in that cabinet. Now, when you were born, your whole cabinet was clean. There were no, no files on the inside, no convictions. You had no reference of language at all. If you were raised by Chinese parents, they would have put a new file in this clean cabinet and they have, we would have put words in there that I'm not going to try and pronounce. But I remember when we, when our kids were small, one of us would say, Se mama, and the other one would say, Se papa. And we had this race to see which one of the two words that the little baby would respond to first. And I think the first word, word was mapa, a combination of the two. But the fact is, as you sit here today, every part of who you are has been programmed into you except for your natural existence and maybe some of your uh, natural tendencies and talents, most of who you are has been programmed into you. You are the result. You are the, um, the product 
of all of your experiences, your education, the people that you grew up with. You are the product, you are the result of a set of convictions that you have about what is good, about what is bad. If you grew up in China, you would feel differently about rice than we would typically do. So what I'm saying is, if you wanted to change one of those convictions, you've been living this way, you've been talking this way for so many years, in that filing cabinet, that file would be about this thick with so many pieces of paper and convictions and experiences on the inside. Now the Bible says you cannot change that. If it is evil, you cannot conquer evil by focusing on evil and saying, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do this. That's not how we change. Change is the result of renewal. You need to open a new file. A new file that says, this is who I am. I am a child of God. I have been made righteous. God has made me complete in Christ. And I live according to His purposes and, and, and from His Word. So you overcome evil, previous conditioning. You overcome it with good, with present conditioning. And the moment that that renewal becomes stronger in your life than your previous conditioning, you will conquer evil immediately. So instead of focusing on your mistakes, stop doing that. Making your stop doing list. Rather go to the place where you say, this is who I am, and I confess it. And I write it down, and I say it, and I sing it, and I read it, and constantly I am affirming God's affirmation over my life. I've seen so many people see massive change in their lives who understood the power of the filing cabinet, understood that Romans 12 says you cannot conquer evil with evil. You overcome evil with good. It's the only way. So what it basically says is also echoed in one of the Greek words in the Bible. The word that talks about um, coming to repentance is one of the translations. In English, in Afrikaans, we use the word bakirio. In the, in the Greek language, it's the word metanoia. It basically means that I lived my life in a certain direction. I've been thinking along certain lines. And metanoia is when you change the direction of your convictions and your thoughts. And you repent. Repent is not to say, I'm so sorry, Lord. Repent is to say, Lord, I'm seeing a new focus, a new life. This is who I am, and this is where I'm going to. So if you want to get rid of sin, let's talk about temptation for a couple of minutes as an example. Temptation is a massive reality in every Christian's life. Temptation is a big word. It is one of the core strategies of the enemy of our lives to de derail us and to take us not just away from our purpose, but to actually pull us away from God ultimately and destroy us. That's what John 10 verse 10 refers to when he says the devil comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. One of his major weapons is temptation. You need to understand how temptation works, otherwise you will never conquer it. And in James chapter 1 verse 13, we get a fantastic reference where it says, Let no one, when you are tempted, let no one say, I'm being tempted by God. So let no one say, oh, I, can't, I can't do anything about this, I can't help myself. He says, you need to take personal responsibility because God cannot tempt you and He doesn't get tempted as well. But each one of us, so He includes everyone, everybody has temptation, everyone has this this powerful force that works on the inside of your filing cabinet of your convictions that's trying to pull you away from your purpose and ultimately from God. Each one is tempted when you are dragged away by your own desires. And in uh, the Amplified Bible, the word desire is translated with lust and with passion. Now this is a little bit confusing, John. How does this work then? Isn't God a bit spiteful then when he says that my own desires are tempting me, are drawing me, are luring me away. He then continues to say in the next verses, he says that if you leave it, it will not just draw you away. He says sin will be birth, and if sin is left alone and goes to, grows to full completion, it will actually destroy you. So what I've discovered is God gave me the full set of desires that I have in life. Every desire that I have comes from Him. But He also gave me a platform where I can fulfill that desire. The best example is your sexual desire, your desire for sexual intimacy. It is something that was given to us by God. It is not evil in the first place. 
but he gave us marriage as the platform where I can live out this desire and this need in my life. And the problem for us is when we are leered away, it's not to be leered away from your healthy sexual life. It is when we are leered away from God's provision for that particular desire. You have a desire to be known. You have a desire to be famous. Well, the fact is, if you get to that point where you discover that you are already known by God and that fame from a distance doesn't please as much as fame in, in intimate relationship, it doesn't impress me so much if other people like me. I want to know if the people that know me the best, my wife and my kids and my family, if they have a high regard for me, then it satisfies this need. He gives us a place where we can be famous in a healthy way. All of us read um, the, the newspapers and the magazines where he talks about how fame is destroying people because they are lured away from the deepest desire that you have is to be known. And to be known by your creator frees you from all of what from all of these forces that you actually want to feed from from other people and even people that that don't really like you so what I'm discovering is that temptation is a massive reality and this temptation can destroy you we need to know it and we need to know that it works in our natural desires but if we go and fulfill those desires in our relationship with God and in every place that He gave us to fulfill them, it will never lure us away again. The last couple of minutes of this talk today about integrity, I want to take you to one of the best examples in the New Testament of what I've been speaking about today. It is found in Colossians chapter 3, verse 9, where it says, Don't lie to one another. Let's just stop there for a minute. Have you ever been in a place where somebody discovered that you haven't been sharing the full truth. They discovered, and they keep you accountable, and they say, no, 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 wait a minute, you said something else the other day. And then you've got that split-second decision that you have to make. Am, am I going to be a people pleaser and lay down my pride and say sorry? Or am I just going to load another lie on top of it? And haven't we all done it? You can put up your hand. No, don't. You can just agree with me that all of us have done this. That's why the Bible says don't do it. Don't lie to one another. Oh, okay, Paul, I don't want to lie, but I constantly find myself doing it. How do I change it? Then he goes to the whole metaphor of the filing cabinet again, and he says, you have stripped yourself of your old self with all of its evil practices. So he says, in your identity, I'm opening up a new file. And I'm telling you, you have stripped yourself of all of those um, evil practices. Verse 10, and you've put on a new spiritual self who is continually being renewed in the true knowledge, in the image of him who created that new self. Paul sometimes puts so many phrases into one bucket that it really confuses us. Basically what he is saying is, if you look at your old self, that's not the definition of who you are anymore. There's a new self that is found in your relationship with Christ. This is who I am. It's an inner code, a connectedness to my creator. And now I look at my behavior, and how do I not lie to one another anymore? I get victory on the inside first by affirming this is who I am, and then I can strip myself of the old habits. You will never have the drive and the power to live a life of integrity. You will never have victory over sin by focusing on your sin, by focusing on those habits. You need to replace it with a new revelation of your identity in Christ, that He has redeemed me, He has sanctified me, and now I can take sanctification to every part of my existence. May God really set you free from the slavery of sin consciousness. Maybe you become more aware of who you are in Christ so that you can turn around and say, that is not who I am anymore. Amen. <laughs>